Hi, uh, my name is Jason Kay. I am an agent with EXP Realty here in lovely Boulder, Colorado. Um, some background before I get started. I spent 18 years in mechanical engineering in R&D and product development. My first job out of school was Bell Labs, where I owned most of my 35 patents and my master's from engineering at Columbia while working full time. Fast forward 18 years, my wife had more prospects and clients than she could handle. So she recruited me from my technical sales engineering job, project management job that was an hour and a half from home. <clears throat> oh, and they were missing payroll at the time too. So for those of you thinking I have a gift, this comes naturally, notice that background doesn't mention real estate at all, other than buying my first home when I was 23. This doesn't come naturally to me, this is learned. The point is, if I can learn it, so can you. <clears throat> My first sale took me nine months. I showed that client 127 homes, and I made less than minimum wage on that sale, which is still cheaper than getting my undergrad degree. But the net takeaway from that experience was something had to change, and fast. Because while it was a great commission check, it wasn't enough to pay nine months worth of bills. <clears throat> And here's the key, key point. It was painful. The client didn't respect me or think I knew what I was doing. So they fought me literally every step of the way. Can any of you relate to that experience with a client ever? I mean, the point is you don't need to work with everyone. The goal is to build a pipeline big enough where you pass on those problem clients like my first one. This isn't that class though. So a huge part for me moving past my first client experience was creating my value proposition. Some, okay, a big part of it was learning how to communicate because remember that piece about being an engineer? They're not known for getting their ideas across very clearly other than on a piece of paper. So <clears throat> some of it was creating a system for buyers. Some of it was, hey, what's my wife doing with listings? Can I copy that? So, you know, does this sound like what some of you actually do with your listing leads? I seriously hope so, because as I said, I R&D'd my wife's listing packet and made it specifically for buyers. And by the way, R&D meant rip off and duplicate more times when I was an engineer than not. It was definitely true with all my patents. Anyway, let's address that pink elephant in the room first. <clears throat> I was advised by a Colorado real estate attorney of the following, so this is not my opinion, and is biased a little bit towards Colorado. Key point, check with attorneys in your state. A lot of the real estate attorneys are doing webinars. Go listen to one so you know what you're dealing with. And when you are dealing with the law, be very, very specific and careful about what you say and how you say it. Now back to our regularly scheduled show. So, NAR settlement. <clears throat> As you know, most of you have been following, over a million realtors have been released. All state associations, all associations owned by MLS. And just to give you an idea, the two that I belong to in Colorado are clear. The one I used to belong to in Colorado, uh, in New Jersey, is not. So you might want to check. Um, all brokerages under $2 billion in transactions and that are NAR member owned. Um, this doesn't unfortunately include large brokerages like EXP or franchise holders or Home Services of America. Now, what's the nub of this? Compensation. After mid-July, sellers still can offer a buyer agent compensation. They just can't advertise it in MLS. However, seller concessions can be advertised in MLS. They can also be used to pay a buyer agent. I wonder where this is going to go. Anyway, buyer agents can charge a fixed fee, an hourly rate, or a percentage of the sales price. What's probably gonna happen here is the Wild West with a ton of experimentation. What ultimately is gonna happen is you're probably gonna have two groups of people. Those who communicate their value proposition clearly, think like a top level attorney or a specialist doctor, and those more with the Walmart proposition. Low fees, low service. Who are you gonna be? Either is fine, but what do you want your business to look like? Now, Buyers can put in additional provisions in Colorado in the contract that the seller is obligated to pay the buyer at closing. This is likely going to be a point of negotiation, just like all of the other terms in the contract. So get ready for it. 
NARA is going to be paying out $418 million over four years. They're not planning on increasing dues in 2024. I've even heard 2025. Don't know if that's true. MLSs will be allowed to charge a per subscriber fee to fund the settlement. And I know from past experiences that usually gets passed on to the agent. So as these fees get increased to us, it's going to go right back to the consumer, which is exactly what they were trying to avoid. So what impacts are we looking at? <clears throat> There's a couple of big ones here. The first one obviously is the one most agents have heard about, that you're going to have to have a buyer agency agreement signed before you're legally allowed to show a house. There's a massive caveat except for states whose laws specifically prohibit that practice, of which Colorado happens to be one. So what does this mean for open houses? Check with your broker, check with an attorney, find out that way. CR CMAs and appraisals are going to have a huge issue because if sellers stop offering buyer compensation, that compensation they used to offer is going to increase the price on the homes. So these professionals are going to need access to that data to lower the price accordingly in order to have a fair analysis. MLSs may put that data back into their system after it closes because it's not advertising what we could get, it's this is what was paid out, this is fact. Here's another key point. If you don't get the buyer agency agreement or here in Colorado exclusive right to buy contracts signed before you get under contract, you might not get paid. Most importantly, the way e &O works, I've been told by an attorney, is if you're not being paid a commission, you're not covered by your e &O. So not only do you not get paid, but you're going to have to pay out what your e &O would cover if you ever get sued. Not a good combination. Last point, the seller might not offer compensations, but the buyers can put that compensation into the contract in additional provisions. In other words, if the buyer is paying, that can go in as well. So enough of the boring stuff. Let's get on to how you get the buyer agency signed. So <clears throat> I know that there are agents out there besides myself because I asked this when I teach my class. Has anyone gotten the buyer, taken the buyer out once and then written up a contract? About 10% of the agents do. Why do you think this happens? I'll give you a hint. It has everything to do with your value proposition. Did you do a really good job explaining to your clients and having them understand what you do? Or do you get lucky like a blind squirrel finding a nut? So part of this, for me at least, was knowing my numbers. How many homes do you show on appointment? How many times do you take a client out before writing an offer? How much time do you invest on a client before you even take them out or in total? The whole point of this is what's your hourly rate? If we're talking about becoming a professional, like those top paid specialists and attorneys and doctors, you need to know what you're worth. And more importantly, are you getting better with what you're doing? How can you improve? So if you don't measure it, you don't know. Where is this all going? Easy. Would you rather spend one or two hours before taking a client out on a meeting, making it one time, and then write up an offer that gets accepted after seeing only two to five homes? How many of you are right now are getting a buyer agency agreement signed before you take a client out? Here's a better question. How many of you are going to after mid-July? So other than getting paid, do you know why this is so crucial? Give you a hint. It has everything to do with your value proposition and how the clients interact with you on the back end. That's the secret sauce. So here you go. Take out a pen. Write this down. This is important. You need to have your clients and prospects know what your value proposition is. Why would they want to hire you? What do you bring to the table? Other than, hey, if you want to see this house, you have to sign this piece of paper. It's law. That works. I use it. But there has to be more to it. So what is your value proposition, you ask? Well, there are three main parts. Think of it as a stool. And if one of the legs is short, it's going to be a pretty wobbly stool. Or if one of the legs is weak you might fall on your butt. Anyway, what are these three legs? The first part, set expectations and qualify. This way you're working with clients who are serious. More importantly, they know how you work. You don't get phone calls at 10 o'clock at night. Second, do the clients understand the process? We're talking about soup to nuts, everything you offer. 
there's a phrase from coaching. If they author it, they own it. So don't tell them what the process is. Ask them questions. Have a sheet and go, these are the steps. What do you think happens here? What do I do? Involve them in that discussion because now they know exactly what's going to happen. The third piece, skills and mindset. Because if you can't say it right, if they don't hear you, if you're speaking in Italian and they only understand English, you're not going to get your point across. And we're going to, I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. So unsurprisingly, there is no one magic thing to make this work. As I've said, I've got a 94.6% success rate on getting buyers the first home that they look at. You know, is this a fluke? I was told by seasoned veteran agents it is. You know, it's the whole blind squirrel thing. They said that this business is not rocket science, yet it's a lot of hard work. Well, I've done rocket science, and I'd argue that this is more difficult. It is hard work, but it's very easy to become really, really good at it and to make it less hard. Over the last six years, I've been taking clients out once before they've made an accepted offer, and I've only missed twice in that time frame. One of my clients, they got cock. I got cocky, short circuit my usual process since he was a friend. I took him out three times. Twice was back to the same house. One of them was with his mom since he was a first time buyer. I think we looked at maybe five, six homes total. So not bad for a failure, right? So how many times did I take my clients out during this post COVID insanity? How many offers did I write? Easy, once and one. Well, okay, one client oh, was twice because they really, really loved the hope and they were hoping against hope they could get it. Absolutely maxed out their budget and they were still way under the sales price. So there's no way she was going to get that one. But she learned from that process. She's like, I know I'm not going to get it, but I will kick myself if I don't even try. Okay, fine. So she knew going in what was expected and what it would take to win. Anyway, how did I do this? Well, it's easy. As I've said before, and I've gotten this across one or two more times, they knew what they wanted to look at. This wasn't, oh, maybe it was right. This was, I want to live in this home forever. This is it. <clears throat> I'll show you how I do that in a little bit, either in, later in this series or in the next episode. And I'll show you exactly the script I use and how to implement it. I said this before, this is important. Write this down. The most important thing, they took part in the strategy. They helped create how they're going to get their home with me. They took time interpreting the market with me, and more importantly, what that means for them and what they have to do in order to hit their goals. So how did I do this? Part of it's instead of saying things, making that statement a question. Part of it was figuring out what it would take to get my clients their offers accepted. I mean, that's changed three times since that insanity. Now, I did this before I wrote the offer. Hint. Big part was calling or texting the listing agent on what the seller is looking for in an ideal offer besides list price. That's my script right there. Write it down. Use it. What are they looking for? Because many times you can offer less money if they're looking for a quick close, all cash. Hey, we could do it in 10 days. Great. That's important. Part of this was talking to other agents outside of the area, outside of the deals on what was working for them. This included going for drinks, coffee, really hard stuff, you know, going on Facebook, like lab code agents, what's working for people. So that was super, super critical. That got me a huge success rate and a leg up for everyone else because I saw what was working. I implemented and it worked for me. So why am I not telling you what I did? Don't need to do it anymore in my market. And honestly, I don't know what your market is right now and what it'll take. So you need to ask around. Huge part of this, most important thing, was having my clients understand what it takes and that they hired an expert to help them get there. Don't fight me. It's going to be hard enough. So do you ask a brain surgeon what type of scalpel they're going to use? Or do you ask them what their success rate is? Are you willing to do open heart surgery on yourself to save those ridiculously high hospital costs? That's your value proposition on why your client should hire you. You know, notice I've used that phrase a lot. That is my script. This is why you should hire me. Literally, that's what I say to my clients when I take the buyer agency out, slide it across the table and ask them to sign it. 
So once your clients understand your value proposition, they will value you. They will sing your praises to all their friends, their families, their coworkers. I mean, Joe Stumpf said it best, by referral only. That's it. What can you offer them? Expertise in the marketing or expertise in the market? Knowing the common inspection issues, knowing the good inspectors, how to negotiate. Um, have you had to take a contracts class lately? Is your contract changing? Did you know FISBOs typically sell for 9% less than the market? And they have three times the litigation because the participants only sell a few homes in their lifetime versus an active professional who will sell that in a quarter or a month or even a week. Don't forget about your network of professionals that you work with and you're continuing to stay on top of issues like this and advocacy and fiduciary responsibilities. Are you starting to get the point here on what your value proposition could be? Do you think you might hear this once or twice more in this session and the next session that is coming after this? By the way, do you guys just realize what I did to set your expectations on what you might hear? That's how that's done. So I took many classes over the years to be a better agent. There were really only two that were outstanding, that stood out head and shoulders above everything else. And I'll tell you what those are in a minute. But do you role play? Do you use scripts? Have you internalized those scripts so they don't sound mechanical or robotic, so it doesn't sound like you're reading them? I remember my wife, she was role playing and all, it was like a switch that got flipped. All of a sudden I'm like, are you on a live call? What's going on? No, no, this is your role play time. And she's like, yeah, I'm on a role play. I'm like, oh my God, internalized. It's like that. It's really amazing when it happens because once it does, these just fall out and you don't even realize they're in there. When I started to role play and learn scripts, I was awful at it. I mean, really, really bad. It's awkward. Let's face it. Role play is awkward. Then it wasn't as it got internalized. And that's the whole point. The point is, role play is to practice what you're going to say to those standard objections buyers and sellers have all gone to school for and always throw at you. Would you rather practice and get a do-over or just wing it and lose a client? Now, what I might tell you might tick you off. I don't know about your market, but the average home price in Boulder right now is 1.7 million. We're talking for a 3-2 on a tenth of an acre that needs updating. The median list price of homes, 2.2. So the point is, if you practice on a client, it's a very, very expensive way to practice. And by the way, you should also know the numbers for your market. That was the point of me telling you those silly high numbers, not to gloat about how unaffordable Boulder is. You know, there's a reason why the best athletes say they practice harder than when they play a game. So you remember when I told you, I'll tell you about those classes. The first one's neuro-linguistic programming. Um, <clears throat> no idea what that is? Well, the main gist of NLP is it is just as important on how you say something as to what is actually being said. There are key words. There are triggers. Many agents are uncomfortable with this. They think it's unethical. I'm imposing my will on my clients. I'm brainwashing them. The only thing this helps with is communication. Having my client hear me and understand me. The only thing it brings to me is clarity for my clients so they can make a decision and quickly because it's obvious to them and clear what their path forward is. Now, I took multiple classes about the DISC profile. There's some really good ones in the EXP library from Dr. Abelson. By all means, watch them, take the classes. And I am gonna slip into DISC speak because I speak DISC, kind of like engineered in Italian and German. They're all other languages. Anyway. I practice the DISC, practice NLP, both alone and with my role play partners. I listen to the recordings of the classes. Now, mind you, the NLP class I took was 18 weeks long. It had homework. It cost me over $1,000 talking a decade ago. So it wasn't cheap, but it was so worth it because I made that back a hundredfold in the first year after I implemented. But the point is, I had to put hard work in. This isn't just watch an hour-long class or two 20-minute sessions and you'll be good to go. Will it help? Yes. But if you want to become a master at this, a true expert, you're going to have to practice. And that's the point. So I did role plays 
I had uh, eight partners over a week. One partner had twice a week. The hardest thing we did, sign calls and Zillow calls. We're not talking 15 minutes and done. We're talking 30 minutes per side. So I was putting in an hour, two or three times a week with this one person. Now we practice scripts. We practice different disc profiles. We practice different objection handlers. Does this sound like, oh, I'll just give it a try? Or does this sound more like how a pro athlete would practice? You know, part of that mindset was affirmations. Seriously, engineer, affirmations. But the point is, the more you look at something, the more you say something, the more your subconscious will look for ways to make it happen. There was a Stanford study that showed that the brain could handle something like, um, I think it was 40 bits per second of data in your conscious mind but your subconscious mind could handle something like 20 million bits. So you want to talk to your subconscious. That's the whole point of the affirmations. So basically it sits there and has a huge flag. Hey, I'm over here. Look at me. You, opportunity you've been looking for. This way you can see it and don't miss it. So do you use affirmations regularly? Take out a pen, write this down. I'm giving you my top one that I love that I use every day, posted right there on my mirror as I'm brushing my teeth, read it every morning and evening. I am a magnet for many easy and lucrative deals. That's it. There you go. Whole point, I wrote it as if it already happened. So my mind is making it happen, looking for ways to have that happen. So you better believe finding a perfect home was on that when every time we've moved. So you've got the idea here. That's part of that mindset piece. All right. Do you guys do a buyer consult the first time you meet a client? Do you actually interview the client and qualify them before you do that? I have a buyer intake form. I nicknamed it the Biff. It came from another company, heavily modified. They called it the LP Mama. But the whole point here is I usually have a call with the client. I ask a lot of questions. I put it into the CRM. Now, what's the point of this? Well, I'm trying to learn what their disk profile is on this call. I'm also trying to understand what are they looking for. More importantly, as a client is going through, I'm looking for what their hidden motivations are. I had a client told me exactly what he wanted. And when he saw it, he's like, yeah, it's perfect. I can't buy it. Because he had a brother who was in a wheelchair and couldn't get to the room. The point is, he didn't even think about that as being an important thing. Did I find him a house? Absolutely. Was it what he was looking for the first time? No, because you've changed his mind and what was important. Process can be iterative. But using the disk, using NLP would have helped tease that out with that client before we looked at a whole bunch of homes first. So <clears throat> what's the disk? Why do you use it? Well, the whole point here is you were going to talk to an engineer differently than you talk to a CEO. They speak different languages. That's why attorneys and engineers hate each other so much, unless they're a patent attorney and then they're both. But you get the point. So have you heard a client say they really care about the feel of the neighborhood, how good the schools are, what the neighborhood is like, what the neighbors are like? Or do you hear someone saying, I really want to see great light coming in from the home. I want to have a wonderful view. These are different ways people communicate. These are different ways they learn. Key in on that. So I'm going to really gloss over the disc quickly here. Dr. Abelson has a great class on it. I think it's an hour or an hour and a half. Go watch it. We'll drop the link in. So I'm talking about this BIF, this buyer intake form. It is a questionnaire. You know, it goes beyond price, beds, bath, things like that. What are nice to have? I ask, what are the three top features that you must have in your home or you're not going to buy it? And I ask it again, if their spouse is involved, I ask them each to fill out what their top three are, then combine the list. Then I'll ask them who had which pieces. It seems like idle curiosity, but if let's say the high powered CEO has nothing on the list and the wife has all three, I know I need to concentrate more on the wife because she's the one that's making the decision, even though the other guy is all blustery. That's happened in real life to me, real life example. Here's two scripts, super, super important to dig in. And a great example is, hey, what are you going to do with that third bedroom? Is it going to be an office, a guest room? Or are you planning a family? Or will a non-bedroom suffice, like a loft or an actual office? 
the script, tell me more about that, or what will that do for you? Use them interchangeably. That's how you dig deep. I hear you asking, but how will this work in real life? <clears throat> well, if you don't do a good job here, and many agents don't, some don't even learn from their mistakes, you're going to show 127 homes over nine months. If you do it right, you take the client out once. Now, during the buyer consult or even during the qualification phone interview using the BIF, I tell them that there are, I will likely ask the same questions over and over again, not because I forgot the answer, but because the process can be iterative. And yes, I just said that before. This is likely the largest purchase of their lives and a very, very big deal. The next largest purchase is going to be the next home they probably buy. Get a point here. So ask when you're doing that buyer intake to set a buyer console at the end of it. It doesn't always work, but do you know what I've just done here? How I've made the client feel like they've been heard, understood, that I've got their best interests at heart. More importantly, does anyone know what this does for the client? I said it before, it helps them discover their motivating factors. Really, really important. So I'm going to wrap it up here. The next thing that I'm going to be talking about is how you give information during the buyer consult. It's not to give them information, but to set buyer's expectations through it and by asking questions, right? And by the way, that's how you convert a statement into a question or by telling stories. So congratulations. You've just got the full ingredients list. Next up is the recipe on how you pull all these pieces together and make a wonderful buyer experience.